Hi, my name is Mike Fenton, President and CEO for the ACG Toronto Chapter, and I'm pleased to introduce the second edition of the Influencer Series. This event was hosted at the TMX Broadcast Centre in Toronto and featured Jim Pattison, Chairman and CEO of the Pattison Group, and moderated by David Poirier, CEO and founder of the Poirier Group. Before we get to the conversation, I'd like to welcome Rob Peterman, VP Global Business Development, the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the TSX Venture Exchange. The new TMX Broadcast Centre will be the host venue for our series over the course of the next year. I'd also like to recognize our other series sponsors, BFL Canada, the Poirier Group, and our broadcast partners, Human Contact and Merge. Rob? All right, it's great to see everyone here today. We're uh, very excited to be using the venue and, and have people here in, in person. Um, so we've been a, a partner with ACG for a long time and you know we really do believe that there's this flow between the public and, and private markets that's very important and, and something that, that we really believe in is, is the best um, for companies and creates the best results. Um, so on behalf of TSX, really happy to welcome you all here today. Um, 2021 um, was an amazing year for financing Canadian companies. So um, if you look around the landscape, you had a record amount of venture capital raised in Canada, you had a record volume of PE deals happen in Canada, and on our public markets, we had a record number of new listings and IPOs in the market. So I've put up a couple of the statistics here, but $57 billion raised, um, over 100 innovation companies, so starting to see a change uh, in the landscape. And for us in total, it was two, over 250 corporate companies coming to TSX and TSXV last year from Canada and around the world. Um, a little snapshot of, uh, of the marketplace. Um, some of the percentages didn't come through here, but we're about 26% financial services and people often think of us uh, as a resource exchange, but we're seeing the innovation sector growing and at points last year, our innovation sector passed the mining sector, which was a, a huge change for the Canadian markets. Um, the other thing that happened during the IPO boom last year was we saw a number of new investors coming into this market and particularly specialist investors out of the US and Europe coming to take part in some of the different companies coming to market here. So we see about 40 to 50% of our trading every day coming from outside of Canada. So companies in this marketplace are accessing uh, capital from around the world. And this is our business development team. And again, you know, really glad to be here today and, and take part in this conversation. And, and thank, you for, uh, thank you for being here. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, thank you, Rob. Now for our main interview, over to you, David, for our conversation with Jim Pattison. As Mike mentioned, this has been very exciting and uh, we've been uh, battling through the pandemic, waiting to, to get together in person uh, again. Um, just a little bit of background, I, I told Jimmy that I'd be sharing this story. So he and I met two and a half, uh, two and a half years ago on an elevator in Barbados uh, after each of us had had a, a business meeting down there. So it was uh, quite ironic that we were in this uh, four foot by six foot uh, elevator together and uh, began a conversation which has led to a few meetings uh, together, three in, one in Barbados, two in, uh, in Vancouver, and then today. So uh, really honored to have you here. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, let, so let's start in the beginning. There's so much to talk about. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, uh, Mike mentioned that you were born in Saskatchewan. I know you're, you're a solid Westerner as well, but could you tell us a little bit about the, your beginning and how you started out? was born in, we lived in Looseland, Saskatchewan, population 300. And uh, my mother went into Saskatoon to get me born. And uh, it's about 150 miles from Looseland. And by the way, I go back every year, I drive back to Looseland and, and go through, because we're, we have a, a bunch of John Deere dealerships in Saskatchewan. So I go back every year and visit all the dealerships. And so I always stop by and see the mayor of Saskatchewan, or mayor of Looseland. And, uh, and then my dad 
uh, moved to Vancouver in the Great Depression, uh, 1935, and I was an only child, and uh, and so he was uh, he got a job. Uh, he was debothing pianos door to door, and, uh, and for those of you that aren't familiar with pianos, they used to have like felts. You push a key down, and and they hit a felt, and in what a lot of times the moths would get in the felts and. If your piano was hadn't been used for a while, you'd go play the piano, and the moths would fly out of the piano. So, uh, and in, in those days, there was no television, and most people had uh, pianos in those in those towns, and they for singing and their kids and so on. And so, my dad and I demoth pianos. I helped them in grade one. I did. He took me along with him in small towns, and then, then he got a job selling used cars in Vancouver. And um, when we moved from Saskatchewan, and then of course I grew up in Vancouver. And um, I married. I got um, three children, and uh, I struck out. I worked for a GM dealer for in Vancouver, Pontiac, Buick, Cadillac, Bull McLean for 10 years, and then I struck out on my own in the gas station. We had a three-pump gas station, two-car showroom, and uh, the, the dealer was not making money, and General Motors uh, gave me the opportunity, and uh, the Royal Bank. I didn't. I had seven thousand dollars equity in my house, and uh, the Royal Bank loaned me forty thousand dollars, and uh, uh, I guaranteed the loan. And my wife, she guaranteed the loan, and I gave them um, the title to my house if I sold it. So they, they. Uh, have seven thousand dollars equity because I didn't have any cash, and they loaned me forty thousand dollars, and I got started, and that was nineteen sixty one, and uh, and then I went from cars right off the bat. I went to leasing, car and truck leasing, and then into radio, and from radio I got into groceries. And today we're in about 12 or 13 different types of businesses. And so we're a, sort of a small little conglomerate is what we have. Yeah. And, uh, and we have, uh, we own Ripley's, believe it or not, an American company, I bought it. And then I bought Guinness World Records over in London. Their headquarters is London. And then we got into the lumber business, which is significant with us. And uh, we've come through this this uh, last couple of years uh, pretty well. Uh, we had uh, the worst business that we've had was billboards. We're the largest in Canada in the billboard business, and that includes airports. Uh, buses, uh, trains, uh, with the transit business, and uh, <clears throat> and people just quit advertising uh, in, on the billboards by and large. Certainly airports and people stayed at home. So that's the business we got hurt the worst in was billboards. And the other one is we own the Great Wolf Lodge. We built it in Niagara Falls, and we shut it down. So that we got hurt. We were losing about a million a month, so that shut down. And uh, and now it's opening up. And um, so that's that and, and billboards were the worst. We got hit the worst. And the best business that we had was... I guess would be groceries was good, and uh, 
groceries and lumber would, would be our, the two best businesses we've had during the, this bad few months. We, well, it's going on, what, two years? Yeah, two years, yeah. So. I think your uh, automotive has worked well for And the well. car business was my big surprise, was the car business, used car business, has been very strong. And uh, new cars, not so much because we couldn't get them. But the used car business and our leasing business has been very, actually, we got 30, over 30,000 cars and trucks on lease. And we actually are selling used cars coming off a lease at a higher price than we paid for them two years ago. I mean, I mean, it really has been turned out to be very good. So that's the good and the bad, of course, as I said, Great Wolf Lodge totally shut down, billboards where we got hurt because we had the leases to pay and the buses and the, like the, with the transit system here in, in Toronto. Uh, we have a contract, but the people weren't driving, but we still had, we still had the contract to pay. So that's the ones we got hurt the worst with. And uh, that's about it. I, so, uh, you know, you, I, I remember in, in our, some of our previous talks, you talked about having to, uh, to learn to be a salesman. And uh, uh, some of the things that you did, I remember you talked about going door to door and, oh, yeah. and selling things. I sold, uh, I sold, uh, I started off selling garden seeds door to door uh, when I was in school. And uh, and then I sold subscriptions to magazines, door to door, and uh, and then I got into pots and pans, door to door, selling pots and pans, <laughs> and uh, so I've always I've always pretty well worked since I was seven eight years old after school and uh, went to UB, University of British Columbia, and uh, I worked with the newspapers on delivering papers in the late edition with the racing, uh, racing results and all of that. So I've pretty well worked all my life. I actually like it. And so, so then I struck, uh, I worked for this General Motors dealer in Vancouver for 10 years. I was very fortunate. He actually was a Nash dealer, Nash, and he got he bought half interest in uh, a GM franchise called Bull McDonald, and they had Pontiac, Buick, and Cadillac in Vancouver, and he took and he had the Nash franchise. I was running the used car lot, and he sold it and took me with him to General Motors, and that was a huge positive. And I worked for him for 10 years, and, uh, and then I got fired. And uh, after 10 years, and I was running the company, and I got fired because he offered me half the business for nothing, but the other half he was going to give to a son-in-law. And I knew a son-in-law, a very nice guy, but he was an excellent golfer, but didn't work very hard. <laughs> And uh, so I said, no, I didn't want to go in business with his partner. So they fired me two months later. And uh, so then I struck out and applied to General Motors. There was a car dealer not doing well in Vancouver, a GM dealer, Pontiac Buick, uh, uh, called uh, um, Marshall Motors, uh, something like that. And, uh, and anyway, they, they had a three-pump gas station and uh, the Royal Bank loaned me $40,000, and General Motors loaned me money, and I got started. And that was 60 years ago. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, got into cars, into leasing, and then I got into other stuff. So you know, a lot of, a lot of people talk about uh, data analytics to figure out you know, how to increase their sales and market. And I love the story about when you were uh, going door to door and you were trying different techniques and whistling was one of them, right? Yeah. Well, I learned when I was going door to door, this is selling pots and pans, that, uh, that if I 
when, when I whistled going up the stairs and knocked on the door, the people much more were open to opening the door. Otherwise, uh, if you just knocked on the door, they knew they were selling something and they wouldn't be interested. So I got more doors open, and I had to tell them my story about pots and pans and how they could be healthier if you used this kind of pots and pans. And, and, uh, and, then, and I did that and did quite well at it. And um, then I, but I went door to door selling garden seeds uh, in the springtime when I was going to school. So I've always, uh, always pretty well worked at something. So data analytics from 75 years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> on what works and what doesn't work. But the selling. big issue, I mean, the big deal with me was borrowing money. I mean, I didn't have the Royal Bank loan me $40,000 to get started. Anybody knows Van at the corner of Camby and Broadway? The guy's name was Harold Nelson. And uh, it took him, he, and his limit was 5,000 and I needed 40 to get started with this GM dealer that was not doing well. And uh, he, he applied and they turned him down. So then he came back to me and said, Jimmy, I gotta rejigger this application. He, so he got turned down the second time. And then the third time, he said, Jimmy, I can't get this approved. If I can get the appointment with the manager of the Royal Bank for British Columbia, will you come with me and we'll see if we can get it? And I said, absolutely. And his limit was $100,000 for the Royal Bank for British Columbia at that time. And he took me down, and this fellow, uh, two days after we had the meeting, called up and said, you've got a loan of $40,000. And that's where I started. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful to the Royal Bank, who eventually called my loan. Uh, <laughs> uh, not for default, because the manager called me up, uh, a million dollars, they loaned me 40, I, and my limit was a million as time went by. And, uh, and then I was pressing all the time to grow, and the manager said, Jimmy, you're too big a, a hurry for the Royal Bank, so we'd like to get paid out. So I moved to the CIBC, and uh, the CIBC then took over that loan and uh, I took it up, uh, that, that loan, and uh, they loaned me. I got up to around $9 million with the CIBC, and they called my loan. Again, not for default, because they got nervous, because I went after a company down here in Toronto at the time, and uh, the guy was a director of the CIBC, and they called my loan. Anyway, I went from there to the TD, Dick... Toronto Dominion, came to Toronto, and they gave me a loan. And I started, and I took at that. Dick Thompson was the president, at, it was the guy that gave me the loan. He eventually became the president of the bank. And then I actually, they asked me to go on the board over time, and my loan by this time was 385 million with the TD Bank right here. And they call my loan. <laughs> and I'm a director. Not, again, not for default, because they got nervous. They said, Jimmy, but the TD gave me time to, to take, you know, play, take it down. So I then, the headquarters in Vancouver at the time was the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. And uh, so I went to the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, and they have no, their limits were very small, a small bank. But the headquarters was in Hong Kong, and the manager flew over to Hong Kong uh, to, get, to see if I could get a loan to pay off the TD, and he did. Came back, got 100 million, paid the TD down 100 million, and, uh, and then Dick Thompson was the president, and I was the director, and everything was on a friendly basis, he just got nervous and uh, HSBC, and bottom line is that Dick Thompson, when he retired, the new guy, 
came out and said, we made a big mistake. We like your money, your business back. But I said, it's too late. And today, our main bank is Bank of Hong Kong, Shanghai Bank. And, uh, and they're, they've been our main bank. We still, well, we also now deal, deal with the CIBC. We deal with the Royal. We'll deal with the Commerce. We'll deal with the Montreal. But our main bank today is HSBC. And this is, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. And, uh, and so, and our, we got lots of credit now that we, we're doing fine and uh, business is growing. So, but my point on all of this is that, that I was absolutely at the mercy of the lenders all the time and actually still am. And, uh, but in good to our, but but we got a, a little bit more equity now than we used to have, <laughs> and so that makes the difference. A little bit more. I think I'm going to have to have my loans called more often to be more successful. Well, I'll tell you one thing: you get to know the bankers real well. It, they, they, you know, if you live in Vancouver, there's no headquarters of anything out there much except lumber and stuff like that. But all the financial part of the world is right, right down here, and uh, and so. Uh, but the HSBC, the bank, the, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank headquarters actually is in Vancouver. And, uh, but their limits aren't the same. So, but, but we go to London uh, once a year and say hello to the big bosses in London over there. But, but uh, the, I mean, the, the key people in my life have been the bankers because if we didn't have any money, we wanted to grow. And the only place you could get it is to, bo to borrow money. We're not a public company. We do financing, so it's all private. And uh, all I've had is my house and uh, with my wife, and I still got. In fact, I put the house in the company to use get more equity so I could borrow more from the banks. Well, uh, let's, let's change gears a little bit and talk about... Um, uh, what you look for in acquiring a company. And now keep in mind, some of your competitors are out in the audience here, <laughs> the private equity funds. That's good, well, private equity, they sell. And I'm, we're, we're interested in buying companies. <laughs> uh, so tell us what you look for um, in companies. What interests you in companies? Because you're in such diverse industries, you know, forestry, fisheries, packaging, uh, the, the billboards business, uh, uh, grocery. We're looking for, my religion is return on invested capital, R-O-I-C. And then, and when we get up in the morning, that's what we talk about. We go to bed at night, that's what we talk about, is what's the R-O-I-C and what's the opportunity to grow the business? Those two things have built our company. Is we, you know, one time we used to get a return on sales and uh, then the return and equity and all of that. But in the final analysis, what's built our company has been a return on invested capital. Because that really brings it home. And when you look at companies, um, I, I know you look at the financial side as, as a primary factor in accepting, but uh, I know you also spend a lot of time on management as well. Well, it's everything. In, uh, in, uh, the, we have, right now, we got, I think, 28 car dealerships. And the president of the company's been with me, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And, and every single, every single president of every one of our companies, we have raised, except one, which is John Deere. I went outside for the management of John Deere. Uh, in Saskatchewan. And I, I know uh, some of the folks at Save On Foods and Patterson Foods, and they've been with you for some of them over 40 years. Oh, yeah. They started out delivering, taking groceries from the nice lady at the cash register and take them out, groceries out to her car. President of the company, of our food company, is a guy named Daryl Jones, and he's been with us ever since he went to high school and delivered groceries in, in a little town in British Columbia just outside of Cranbrook, if you know where that is. Cranbrook's between Vancouver and Calgary in the mountains. 
And, and so what do you look for in management? Are there certain traits or characteristics of people? Well, it depends on the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, in broadcasting, you're looking for somebody that's management-wise on the creative side because you're talking about programming. In the case of your, your car dealer, it is Toyota. You know what? You're counting on Toyota. And that was when I, I had uh, two GM franchises and I was the first dealer in Canada that had a domestic franchise, Ford, Chrysler, or General Motors, and I took on Toyota, Japanese car, and they came out to Vancouver and canceled my franchise with General Motors because I took on a Toyota. They changed their mind after we had a conversation uh, f f over a couple of weeks, and then they, they they changed their mind and kept let me keep the GM franchise, but we started with Toyota in Vancouver, and uh, Toyota, of course, today is the biggest car manufacturer I think in the world today. And I dealt with uh, uh, Mr. Toyota in Japan at the time. They were they were a manufacturer. Uh, they manufactured uh, some kind of equipment, uh, nothing, you know, the everyday type of equipment. And, uh, and then they struck out uh, making, General Mick Arthur, if you've heard of him, he was during the war, uh, the Americans sent him in, in the Army of Occupation. Well, he was in there uh, looking after that part of the war in Japan, and he went over afterwards, and. And he phoned the president of General Motors and the pre president of Ford and asked him if they would meet Mr. Toyota and show him how to make cars. True story. Hmm. And Toyota is the biggest car manufacturer in the world today. And we're dealers. And. Uh, We've done very well with them. And then, of course, they got into Lexus. And now that we're coming out of the, the, uh, the pandemic, um, I know you're always looking for new businesses. Where, where do you see the opportunities or the best opportunities? Is it domestic in Canada? Is it uh, the U.S. 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 Oh, yeah. United States. We're, we're pushing hard. In fact, I've just hired two, two people in the States to do nothing but look for companies to buy for us in the U.S. Uh, you recently bought a, a grocery chain in, yes. in the U.S. Small, a small yeah. one in Portland, Oregon. That was just in the last couple of months. We bought, we bought two little chains to get started in Oregon. In, in, we're in the grocery business in British Columbia and Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. We got about 300 grocery stores in the West. And... Uh, and now we've just started in the States. And uh, are there certain industries that you see as, as better opportunities uh, now for, for the, the Patterson, Jim Patterson group? Well, we've done well with uh, Ripley's, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, we've had Ripley's for quite a few years, American uh, Entertainment Deal. We have a... We have a uh, uh, an aquarium here in Toronto or in Niagara Falls here with Ripley's. Um, but Ripley's have got over 100 locations around the world. When I bought it, they had 15 locations and not doing well. Today, they're very profitable and a very good business to be in. Then I bought Guinness World Records over in London, and uh, they've done well. And so... Uh, we got, that's how we got a little bit into the entertainment business. And you've invested in the forestry business further? Well, we got into one. lumber a few years ago, and uh, we've done very well in lumber. The company, the company last year made, we owned, it's a public company, count for, but it made $2 billion last year. We owned 51% of the company. Pretty fortunate timing for getting into the lumber it industry. It was, it turned out. <laughs> We've been in it a few years, yeah. but the last year they've been with, 
with what's happening. But again, we're buying, uh, we're uh, buying and building sawmills in Sweden with that company, and also in uh, the United States. And I know you. Um there's been a lot of talk about you know uh, taxing the billionaires and uh, taxing large capital and um, I, you had a line that uh, that stuck with me for a long time, which is capital flows where it's capital friendly. And that's right, and that's why we're putting more and more money in the states uh, because it, they'll they'll uh, put in they'll help you put money up. They'll put money up a lot in municipalities to get you to come and build stuff in the, we find in the U.S. So it's friendly, and and we we're in Sweden now. We're we're very uh, we're putting serious money into Sweden in the lumber business. Now you um, you you described yourself as a as a small conglomerate. I think we have a different definition of small. <laughs> Certainly, I do. Um, and but you know the audience may think that you have this this massive head office that looks after this uh, vast array of of industries. Can you can you talk about your your philosophy on it? Because I know your your head office isn't large. Well, we don't. All we do is spend money, and uh, so no, there's very, there's very few of us in our office. We have a switchboard operator. Uh, we have my secretary been with me 60 years. She's 83 uh, years old and uh, usually beats me to work every morning. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, and then we have the, the bankers are important, the financial guys, the accountants. We have probably in our office 28 to 30 people. That's everybody, uh, including real estate. We have a uh, we have a real estate division. We own a lot of real of our own real estate, and we've just moved them out, but uh, it, because they're getting bigger all the time, and we're we just uh, built a sixty, we built a fifty five fifty six story building in downtown Vancouver. Built another one that's thirteen. It's finished. Built another one right now that's uh, going to be. Uh, 30, 30 stories, and boy, I can tell you right now, the business, the real estate business in British Columbia is very strong. Now I know that, uh, and uh, I remember you, you telling me in one of our conversations that uh, I, I said my business was doing well, and you said, well, it, it must be your spouse that's behind that. Uh, yeah, she's here today. I know you have two very strong women uh, uh, supporting you for quite a while. Well, I've been married 70 years now, 71. I've been married 71 years, got married in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan when I was 23. And uh, um, uh, my executive assistant, uh, Angie, has been uh, talking with Maureen for, for now uh, just over two years, and she's picking up a lot of tips. So I'm. Uh, <laughs> He's certainly uh, keeping me in line, and, and uh, Maureen's very much on top of, of uh, everything uh, around your, your well, business. Well, I've been very fortunate. I've got two women in my life. My, sec my wife, I've been married, as I said, 71 years now, and, uh, and Maureen's been with me. She's been with me 63 years, and she's married. she actually married our lease manager. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a small world indeed. Um, uh, I know one of the uh, one of the areas that's really emerging is the whole idea of um, uh, ESG and the movement to green. And uh, this, I know, all organizations are being pressured to do something on that. And that's an, is that an area of focus for you? Absolutely, it's our number one issue today. Is what you just brought up, and we we have a coal port in Vancouver. And this, in fact, is the largest coal port in uh, certainly Canada and one of the largest in America. And, uh, we've, and we've just made a deal. We've got to transition out of coal, and we've just made a deal to do a deal with potash out of Saskatchewan with the biggest mining company in the world out of Australia 
to, and we are in the process now of starting to convert our coal terminal. Uh, won't be all of it, but a good third to percent of it we'll now spend. It's going to cost a lot of money to do that, to take potash out of Saskatchewan through our coal terminal and reduce. We got to get out of the coal, thermal coal. Metallurgical coal is, you can't make steel without metallurgical coal. But thermal coal is the one that's not good. For, and we've got to get out of that. And we're in the process of getting out long term of the, of the thermal coal business. And we, we've, um, we, we've seen lots of pressure on uh, supply chains, costs, inflation. How, how do you balance off uh, you know, the increasing costs within, with the business with customer satisfaction. Uh, I know in the grocery business, for example, the costs are increasing substantially. You're seeing a lot of inflation there and, and uh, all the grocery chains are, are trying to figure out how to manage their, uh, their labor costs and their supply chain costs. And uh, what's your, what are your thoughts around customer satisfaction versus costs? Well, customer satisfaction is number one. Uh, if you're going to grow your business, you got to have you got to have operators that are operators, not financial people. Numbers got to work, but uh, we're in the business of the customer. And I think one of the reasons that we've done as well as we have is because we just preach to our own people. We have meetings all the time with our management in these different divisions, and and we preach the gospel of customer service and uh, that's because that's what who who pays the bills and what if when it's all over it's your customer and unless you've got customer satisfaction you you've got to you have to fix it if you don't have it and we have people all the time checking customer satisfaction customer satisfaction number one and honesty always tell the truth Make, you know, we make mistakes, but when you make them, tell the truth and be straight up. And, and uh, uh, maybe you could just comment on, you know, some, some of the lessons, maybe some of the great lessons you've learned over, over time where you've made a mistake and learned from it. Uh, are there any ideas that, that come to mind, assuming you have made a mistake? <laughs> well, I've made just about every mistake. I'm, not lying or cheating, we've never done that. We've always believed in, in doing the, being 100% honest and straight up. But mistakes after that, I've made every other one you can think of. Um, but I think uh, I tried to get into the technology business a couple of times unsuccessfully. Uh, and so I'm out of that. Because uh, was, and this is like, 20 years ago when technology started to move like it's moving very rapidly as we all know today. And, uh, but it's uh, very uh, people oriented and uh, all we can do is supply capital today. Mm. Really, and, and people with technology that they don't need the capital that you do and if you're building grocery stores or car dealerships and stuff that actually requires capital. Good. I think we're, how close are we to the, uh, to the bell here? I think we may be interrupted by the, uh, uh, by the, the bell going off for the, oh, for the stock fine. markets. So we'll probably uh, watch Canfor increase in price again. <laughs> <laughs> well, Canfor is, was a pub has been a public company, a family company uh, that had a family uh, many many years ago. Started count for thir uh, in 1939. Bentley family, who were chased out, they were Jews and chased out of out of uh, Europe, uh, and they came to Vancouver and started this company called. Canadian Forest Products, and over time I started to buy stock in it, and uh, then as the family got older, they uh, eventually we wound up 
of, of buying control of the company. But uh, it was a good, good family company, and, uh, but they were originally came from Europe. Now you looked to take that company private uh, a few I years ago. I tried to take it private, and uh, one of the daughters uh, held it up. She had enough stock that I, and they wanted more money than I offered, and, and uh, I didn't pay any, I made one offer, the best offer, and I didn't change it, and the daughter, who held a large amount of stock, uh, wanted more than anybody else, and I wouldn't do it. Not a lot, actually, maybe seventy-five cents a share or something. But I wouldn't do, I wouldn't do what I thought was the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's those principles that that you've had for a long time, developed over a long time, that have led to your success of not overpaying. Well, it. My father was uh, was a pilot in the First World War, and after the war. Uh, he uh, came back to Saskatchewan and uh, didn't fit in very well. He, but when he was over in Europe and, and it was in the Army of Occupation, they had, he was a pilot and, and they did, uh, did a lot of carousing from time to time and my dad got to drinking too much and, and uh, so, but came back to Van, came back to Saskatchewan and it was uh, through the church in Saskatoon that my dad's life got really straightened out. And of course, uh, when he moved to Vancouver, I grew up in a Skid Road mission to help other people, uh, uh, a gospel mission. And I worked with my mother and dad in a gospel mission until I was 26 years old. So I was always taught to, to do the right thing uh, based on the Christian principles. I think we're probably going to get interrupted any second now or something like that, or maybe not. Great. Uh, maybe you could, uh, if we could turn it to, you know, what advice would you have for, uh, for younger people starting out in business now uh, that want to um, uh, follow or emulate your, your path of success? What would be some of the keys that you would uh, tell them? Well, today is technology is so important today in the whole scheme of things. Uh, boy, that seems to me that's a pretty good place to be. What I've been in is something that anybody could do. All you gotta do is be honest and work hard and understand who the customer is. And because I used to go door to door selling garden seeds that I sold the Saturday evening post door to door, ladies home journal, then I sold pots and pans door to door, and uh, but you know anybody can do that, and uh, but you got to be a worker and and uh, look after your customer. And I always did that, and that's the reason I'm here today is because I I my family didn't have any money, and and I knew if I wanted to get a bike, what had to happen, <laughs> <You know? laughs> or so. That's what this is, and I got my first car. I paid two hundred and fifty-seven dollars, nineteen thirty-seven Austin convertible. <laughs> now you, you've carried on that work work ethic today, as, as I understand. Oh, there's the applause from next door. It's not too bad. Um, I understand uh, that with that um, work ethic, you're still working seven days a week. Yeah, well, I do. I do go to work every day. I usually go to church Sunday morning. Uh, my wife is not well, so we go to church on TV Sunday morning now. And uh, then after that, I go to the office and get ready. We have a month. We have a meeting every Monday morning at six thirty with our senior management every Monday morning. So I get ready to. I go in Sunday afternoon to get ready for the Monday morning meeting. I just saw a lot of uncomfort when you mentioned 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> For the people that have been working from home and you know, doing their commute from uh, 8.59 to 9 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> no, we, we go to work uh, Monday mornings. We, st we have a management. We, as a matter of fact, we have a senior management meeting every Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. And then we have, but we have our, M major management meeting at 6.30 Monday morning, 
but I bring in our top four people uh, every Saturday at nine o'clock. And, and so how do you keep the energy going um, you know, for 60 years and, and still have that, that drive to get up every morning and, and head to work? Debt. <laughs> <laughs> if you keep holding the bank's money, boy, you got to keep running. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, why don't we open it up to the audience and see if there are any questions out here uh, uh, for you. Well, I have my son. Uh, he, he's the president of Ripley's Believe It or Not. And uh, I gave him that job, and he did very well at it back when Ripley's, when we first bought Ripley's uh, in the States, they had uh, 15 locations, wasn't well run. And uh, I brought my son in, not to run it, but went to work for a guy that was running Ripley's and he learned it. And uh, then we moved the head office to Orlando, Florida, and my son, the, his boss retired and my son's been running it. My other, uh, I have two other daughters. One is married to a rancher, not a rancher, orchard person in uh, the Okanagan in Kelowna, British Columbia. If you know, that's where the Oka, that's where the fruits grown. And uh, she married into a a, a farmer there, and, and uh, that's my oldest daughter and my youngest daughter. Uh, we built a Christian school, grades uh, 1 to 12, in uh, Surrey, in Van Surrey being a suburb of Vancouver, and it's grades 1 to 12, and my daughter is, in, youngest daughter, is involved in the Christian school. I have one that I wish I hadn't sold, and that's an airline. Uh, and uh, I bought a small, a uh, little airline, and those of you in British Columbia used to fly on the water from Vancouver to Victoria. And I bought that airline because the guy lost his license because he wasn't maintaining the airplanes properly. And uh, I wound up buying the airline very cheap. And uh, we built it up to, we had 120 airplanes and Air Canada wanted to buy the airline from us and I sold it to Air Canada. And that was a mistake. Mike? I ran Expo 86. Yeah. Yes, the government came to me. I was, uh, I was in the car business, and uh, the government premier came to me and asked me if they wanted to put on a World's Fair in Vancouver, Expo 86, and it was going to be a transportation uh, fair, and would I run it? And uh, so... I uh, thought it over and uh, told him I would. And so I wasn't in my office for three years. I took, took, I took the job on in 1980 and worked. And then he told me I just have to work on Friday afternoon. Every Friday afternoon I could do the rest of the business. Turned out that I worked. I worked for the working on the fair and worked in my office Friday afternoon, <laughs> just reverse. And anyway, it wound up that in the last three years, uh, 80, 
uh, four, five, and six, I wasn't in my office once. And I was traveling all over the world. We had a lot of countries come, uh, including Russia, uh, to the World's Fair we had in Vancouver. And uh, as it turned out, the uh, budget we had was built on, we'd have 13 million people came to the fair. It turned out we had 21 million at the fair. It turned out better than our budgets uh, t turned out. And uh, I spent six years, three years part-time, and then three years full-time running the fair in Vancouver, Expo 86. Okay, that's a very good question. The answer is we don't. Um, <laughs> what we do is we give a lot of responsibility to the management. The basically the only things that I do today is hire the right people and give them the authority and then meet with them on a regular basis five times a year. That's how we run the business. And, but we give a lot of authority, uh, capital. We have a deal with each uh, a company on how much capital they can spend without talking to us. But then at a certain point, then we want to hear about it. Does that answer your question? No, there's no equity in any of our business. I own everything 100%, except we are involved with three public companies that we control. But we knew that going in. And, but, uh, but everything else we own 100%. And most of it we've built. We started with one car dealership. We got 28. We started with one lease company, one lease car. Today we got 32,000 cars and trucks on lease. So we've built our stuff from the ground up pretty well. Didn't have the money, that was the reason for it. I don't understand the last question. The answer is no. <laughs> no. Well, the reason is, over the years, there are very few partnerships that stay together. If you look over a period of time, some partnerships are, are success. Oh, well, they start out usually quite successful. But as time goes by, partners go different ways. And that gets, sometimes it's friendly, sometimes it's not friendly. And, uh, and there's a difference of opinion. And then you get your families involved if it isn't public. And, uh, and I've just said, no, everybody goes their own way. And, and so I've just, the only person, the, uh, the, I've had, I had a w really great guy, he was my, Bill Sleeman his name was, he was my boss at General Motors. And um, when I say my boss, he represented General Motors in Vancouver, and I was a dealer, but I reported to him. And I hired him when I got into the business of going into being a homespun conglomerate, if you like. And I hired him, Bill Sleeman, my boss, if you like, 
because he was responsible for British Columbia uh, for, for guys like me. And I hired him, and he was my right-hand man. And then I had my secretary, who's still with me. And, and then we've never hired a president other than one that she and I didn't decide who was going to run the company. So I've been very blessed with the quality of the people. It's all people. The whole doggone thing. And if you get it that right, if you get the person that fits what you want to do, and that's why I've, I've, most partnerships over a long period of time do not work out. Sooner or later, something comes up that the one partner wants something different or wants to do go a different direction. And, uh, and but so I've never taken a partner in, and, and I could have grown quicker if I did, but I'd rather uh, deal with the banks and uh, let them call my loans. <laughs> and, uh, and three times the banks called my loan, but never for default, always because they said, I was a young man in too big a hurry. And, but each time it all worked out, and today we, as a matter of fact, I just, my office yesterday, the president of the Bank of Montreal came in and visited me in Vancouver. And I came down after I saw him, and he was in Vancouver. And the Bank of Montreal is an important bank with us, but our main bank is HSBC, headquartered in London. And they're the guys that helped us out when my back was at the wall. Well, I, I met with, uh, with Daryl Jones. I have known Daryl Jones for a number of years. We did some work with, with when it was over, Wadey. And, uh, so He's I, the president of our food company. And, and Daryl um, uh, and I had dinner before I, I met with Jimmy in Vancouver for the first time. And, and he said, why, why are you meeting him? And I said, well, who wouldn't want to meet you know, Canada's entrepreneur and legend? And uh, he said, oh, I thought you were going to try to sell him consulting. And uh, I said, no, no, I wasn't. He said, oh, good, because he hates consultants. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a guy that came from a small town in the Kootenays, and uh, he, took, he was, worked in the store when he went to school, uh, after school and Saturdays delivering, taking the, the groceries out from the store to the lady's car. And uh, he started right at the bottom, became, then so he became a store manager. We gave him more responsibility. Days, the president of the company. And every single person in our company that runs the division has come up from inside the company, except one, and that's the agriculture, John Deere. We've got 18 John Deere dealerships in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And I, had to, I took a guy that was uh, brought up in the company and uh, it just wasn't working as good as it should. He's a good guy. In fact, we just bought a farm and he's going to run our farm. And, but I brought this other guy in that was a competitor. And it's the only person in our whole company that we've brought in from the outside. And he's doing very well, by the way. Oh, that's great. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much for, for uh, spending the time with us today and, and sharing your, your insights and, and your stories. And uh, uh, truly a Canadian legend with a uh, small conglomerate. <laughs> and we're just uh, so delighted that, that you joined our Influencer Series. And I want to thank you very much uh, personally for, for coming here for this. Well, thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come to Toronto the capital of our country for economic reasons. <laughs> Thank you. Jim and David, thank you for your time. Jim, you've built an amazing conglomerate. We look forward to bringing you our next edition of The Influencers in the near future. For more information, check out our ACG website at acg.org Toronto.